I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is California's reopening. Look, the state of our state, it remains determined. I remain determined. Governor Newsom delivering his State of the State address this week as restrictions are loosened in counties up and down the Golden State. With us, Dee Dee Myers, one of the governor's top advisors and director of California's Office of Business and Economic Development. Then. By the way, for all those who don't know, smoking the Roy Blunt means retire. That's a new Midas Touch term. In less than a year, Midas Touch became one of the most influential and followed names in all of politics online, and they are now expanding their media empire. The brothers behind Midas Touch, Ben, Brett, and Jordy Micellis, join us as the issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, California's only statewide political show. You're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michelson. After so many weeks of opening this show with devastating coronavirus news, this week, real signs of hope and progress. President Biden signing one of the most consequential pieces of legislation in decades, a $1.9 trillion stimulus bill, which will mean at least $151 billion in aid for California alone. That will no doubt make Governor Newsom's tough job a bit easier. This week, the governor delivering the state of the state address in front of an empty Dodger stadium. The next day, I asked him, what is the state of our state? And we're determined and we're resilient and we're going to come back, but we're not going to come crawling back. We're going to roar back. Dee Dee Myers is a key leader of that process. She is one of the governor's top advisors, the director of California's Office of Business Economic Development. Back in the 90s, she served as White House press secretary. She also worked as a top executive at Warner Brothers and a consultant on the greatest show in the history of television, The West Wing. All right, Dee Dee Myers, welcome to The Issue Is for the first time. Thank you, Alex, and I'm glad you have such great taste in uh, t television drama. Uh, that, that is for sure. We'll talk more about that a little bit later, but let's start with the pressing issues of the day. And, and as someone who is literally tasked with overseeing business reopening in this state, how would you describe the state of our economic state in California? We're really poised for recovery, and there's a lot of good news out there. Uh, California's gone from reporting something like 53,000 COVID cases per day, Alex, to your earlier uh, mentioned to under 4,000 this week. The positivity rate's gone from 14 down to 2.2. Hospitalizations are down more than 80%. ICUs are down 75%. And vaccine distribution, which is the game changer, is, is really ramping up. And that's very encouraging. And in fact, on Friday, well, we were able to announce that we met our vaccine equity uh, target, which means that many counties get to move to less restrictive tiers. And so that is really exciting and means that our businesses can start to reopen safely uh, and with, uh, you know, with, with health in mind and top of mind. So there are several trillion dollars in federal stimulus that are coming right. and several yeah. billion dollars in state stimulus as well. This week, the governor posting this picture uh, with some business owners in Baldwin Park. They are among the beneficiaries of a $2 billion grant program for California small businesses. There are a lot of people watching this right now, Didi, that have had a really tough year and can really use some of that help. How do they get that aid? Uh, well, the first step is to go to careliefgrant.com, uh, and that will that's a one-stop shop to find out more information about who's eligible and how to apply. The application process is pretty simple. So these are small businesses with revenues of $2.5 million or less, and the grants are from five thousand dollars to twenty five thousand dollars and they need to cover covid related expenses so when you say all these numbers we're talking about a lot of money here right uh, everything that is happening both within the state and the federal government republicans uniformly voting against the federal stimulus saying it's just too big and pointing to the fact that california actually has a budget surplus now after the last yeah. stimulus last year we had tens of billions of dollars in unemployment fraud in california how do you protect against that? And what do you say to people who worry that all this money going around is, is simply too much money, especially for government to have? Well, in, for example, in our small business grant program, we have protections in there against uh, fraud and waste and abuse. And, and that was very important to us as we designed the program. There have been problems in uh, unemployment distribution, not just in California, but around the country. And I think the government, the federal government is going to try to put in additional uh, protections against that. That is a problem. It is a challenge. But the really important thing is that millions and millions of Americans and millions and millions of Californians have really been, uh, you know, 
knocked back by the COVID and by the recession, and they need to get a little bit of money back in their pockets to get back on their feet. So let's talk broadly about where California is at, because over the last few months, we've been operating under this tier system. There is a purple tier, a red tier, an orange tier, and a yellow tier, but one color is missing. And I asked the governor about that this week. Here's what he had to say. Right now, we don't have a green tier. We don't have a 100% reopening. Is that something now you're starting to think about? It's a good question. And so we are working quite literally on a green tier. As we get to 10, 15, 20 million vaccinations, get closer and closer to herd immunity, then we will start to make it clear that these tiers were temporary. So what does a potential green tier look like? Yeah, that's what we're working on. What what does that look like? You know, the president of the United States has said that, you know, first it was that he, he expected, the federal government expected everyone who wanted a vaccine, every adult who wanted a vaccine could get one by the end of May. Now they're looking at doing it closer to the beginning of May. So when everyone has access to a vaccine, then you have to start to re relax those tiers even more. I mean, we do, this is a, you know, planned obsolescence. We want this tier system to go away. But in the meantime, uh, you know, there are some flashing caution signs out there with these variants. And we want to make sure that we open carefully, that we open safely, and that we never have to go backwards. By the end of this month, we'll have additional guidance for sectors that haven't been covered yet. For example, events like can you safely have a wedding? How can you do that? How many people can come? So we'll provide additional guidance on those events. I know people are really eager mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to know that it won't happen right away, but there will be a path forward for people to begin again, to get back to some semblance of normal life, to be able to plan. Uh, let's talk for a moment about you. A lot of folks first got to know you in the 1990s as Bill Clinton's press secretary. Here's your last day in that job when you got a surprise visitor. I just wanted to, to uh, come in here and, and uh, say in front of all of you how very grateful I am for everything Dee Dee has done. Uh, Who's and, going to uh, replace her? <laughs> no one is going to replace her. Yeah. So I, I'm wondering, what was, what was sort of a key lesson you learned during that experience in the 90s working in the White House that you now you're able to apply to this job in California? You know, I, I, I learned so we could spend hours on that one, Alex, but I, I think one of the things I learned from Bill Clinton is never give up. I mean, he is the most resilient person I've ever known. Um, he believes deeply in the ability of people coming together uh, to, uh, you know, try to drive toward common goals and make people's lives better and that you never give up. And I think that's the main thing that I took away. You know, I can't have you on the show without asking at least one question about the West Wing. Uh, so you were a consultant on the show, largely um, credited as being one of the main inspirations for C.J. Craig, um, this badass White House press secretary character that they had. For people that haven't watched the show, here is C.J. talking about Saudi Arabia. 17 schoolgirls were forced to burn alive because they weren't wearing the proper clothing. Am I outraged? No, Steve. No, Chris, no, Mark. That is Saudi Arabia, our partners in peace. So how realistic is the West Wing and how much is CJ really like you? <laughs> well, look, CJ and the actress, Alison Janney, who's a, a marvelous actress, one of the most decorated actresses in, in, in both television and film. So, so such an honor to be able to work with her during those years. Um, you know, look, there was a lot that was obviously fiction and drama and Aaron Sorkin, the great creator, always said that he was there to, to entertain and not to provide a history lesson. But there's so much history lesson in there. And I think he was always a little disingenuous about that. I think he really wanted to do both. I think, you know, the, the, the fictional world happens with a handful of people. And as we all know, the real world has a lot more uh, decision makers in it and the decision making process is a lot more complicated. But the big themes of it, how how many issues uh, confront the president and his team every day and how quickly things move and how complicated they are and how many comp compromises you sometimes have to make is very rings true. So we saw this sort of mini West Wing reunion in October when they did this special episode to try to get out the vote. Do you think there should or will be more West Wing? 
You know, I Aaron really, you know, he's sort of been reluctant to do that, but he sort of never said never at the same time. Um, there's an ongoing story to be told. I think the world would love it if Aaron decided to pick up the pen again on, on this topic because the world has changed so much. Um, so based off of what you just said, it sounds like you would be open to the idea of a West Wing coming back. I would. Sure, I'm available. Um, you know, I'll introduce my role as a consultant to, as you described it, the greatest TV show of all time. No, it was really, it was really a fun chapter in, in my life, and I'm really proud to be associated with the show. And I'm really gratified that so many young people over the years have told me that it inspired them to public service and an interest in politics. And so uh, if there's more of that, I'm all in. We like to play music on this show. So this week, our song is inspired by you. It is from the West Wing voting special on HBO Max, where they did their own version of the West Wing theme song. I hope it makes you smile like it does for me. We'll be right back with more. Here it is. At a certain point, we turned to each other and we said, is there anything we could do? And long story short, Midas Touch is the result of that. Six months ago, we first profiled Midas Touch, which essentially started as a quarantine hobby project from three brothers focused on ending the Trump presidency. Well, in the months since, the brothers' influence has continued to grow exponentially. If collective videos were all combined, they have more than 1 billion views. Their videos have garnered 600 million views on Twitter alone, and they have 1.5 million followers now in social media. Their podcast, Midas Touch, is one of the top 10 news and politics podcasts on all of iTunes, and they recently launched the Midas Media Network. Here are the brothers. They each bring different experiences to the table. Ben Micellis is an attorney. He's a partner at Gergos and Gergos. Among his past clients, Colin Kaepernick. Brett is an Emmy award-winning editor who has worked on high-profile projects, including The Ellen DeGeneres Show. And Jordy is a marketing supervisor. His fans appreciate the fact that he's developed into an Instagram model of sorts for Midas <laughs> Touch merchandise. <laughs> So that is another <laughs> skill set that he's bringing to the table. Gentlemen, <laughs> welcome back to The Issue Is. Thanks, Thanks for having us. to be here. Yeah. All right, Ben, let's start with you. There, there are a lot of people who talk about politics online. What do you think has been the key to becoming so viral so often in such a relatively short period of time? I think we're relentless with the content. We trust our instincts and we speak from the heart. You know, I think sometimes you see uh, politicians being very disingenuous, politicians using double speak. We try to keep it simple, stupid. We try to deliver messages that people understand. And we try to speak for the people, not for millionaires, not for billionaires, for the workers out there. And Jordy, after President Trump lost, you really targeted those Georgia runoff races. Explain your strategy there and how you might use that same strategy in other states going forward. From TV, from out of home to canvassing efforts um, to just uh, digital billboard trucks, anything and everything, you name it, we were doing it. And Brett, you all also decided to troll CPAC a bit. This is the conference in Florida where conservatives recently gathered. And on your podcast, when you were interviewing California Congressman Eric Swalwell, you talked about this. We actually had a billboard trucks circling the venue that called it the January 6th uh, reunion. Was, I saw those on uh, Twitter. That was you guys? Yeah. That That's was great. Us. <laughs> <laughs> and then the back of them said Trump 2024 to life. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, President Trump was such an animating force for you and, and your supporters. You already see a lot of people are starting to check out of politics news now that he's gone. How do you keep people motivated when Democrats are now in the majority and you don't have that foil to go against? 
Well, here's the thing, Alex. The fight is not over. The fight is just beginning. So the fact is we do have a foil because, in my opinion, we have two parties in this country, one party that is a pro-democracy party in the Democratic Party, and then we have an authoritarian party that's trying to fill the void that is Trump and Trumpism. We want to highlight the real threat of the GOP and these anti-democratic views, and we think that we could still engage people along that platform and saying, hey, it doesn't matter if you're left, right, center, whatever. Do you believe in democracy? If so, join us on our mission, because this is an existential crisis for our country, and we need you now. Ben, where do you think politics goes after Trump? I think it goes to, as Brett stated, it goes to fighting for democracy. We understand that sometimes politics isn't that sexy or isn't that entertaining, but it's incumbent on us to make it so. And so we're focused, for example, on a Midas University program where we've set up over 20 chapters in different universities across the country. We hope to expand that to 100 in the next few months. We have to engage with the youth. We're speaking to high school students. And so our effort is not just a two-year plan for the midterms. It's not just a four-year plan for the presidential. We're looking at 2030. We're looking at 2040. And we know that this fight is an existential one. Uh, Jordy, to, to that point, though, of, of how to get uh, young people engaged, as, as the youngest brother, who I know has talked about bringing sexy back into politics, <laughs> uh, how do you make politics engaging for a generation that maybe engages with media, engages with information in such a different way. You know, you're really crushing me on that one. The brothers are going to make fun of me so much once we get off of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's all about being always on. It's an always on approach, I think, as we alluded to earlier, and showing up on every platform that you can. <clears throat> when we first started Midas, we made uh, a very uh, intentional decision to be on YouTube, to be on Instagram, to be on Facebook, uh, to be on Twitter, but really then to also show up on TikTok and other platforms where other political action committees weren't necessarily showing up just to show you know, the next generation of progressive voices, hey, we're your outlet. If you wanna get your voice heard, come, come to us, come follow us, we're here to amplify you. All right, well, the Midas Touch guys are sticking around for more. And this is the point of the show, guys, where we get to see those epic dance moves that I know you have. More of the issue is after the break. <laughs> what do you think when you see comments by Republicans like Ted Cruz, who he tweeted a, a few weeks ago? He said, Today's Dems are the party of the rich. It is laughable. That's Ohio Congressman Tim Ryan on the Midas Touch podcast this week. If only I could use the language that you guys are allowed to use. <laughs> we are back with the brothers behind Midas Touch. Jordy, Brett, and Ben Micellis. Brett, uh, you all recently launched your own media network. Where do you guys see the future of media, news, politics? Where do you see all that headed? You, Alex, you, you do a really good job at when somebody is on your show, if they say it's sunny out and behind them it's raining, you call them out and you say, hey, I don't think so. It's, it's raining. I see it with my own eyes. And too often the media out there gives credence to both perspectives. They say, oh, well, he says it's raining. He says it's sunny. And oftentimes there is an answer. And so I think the media needs to be loud and vocal in calling out the truth. And I think that's where Midas Media Network comes in. We just launched our first series called The Divided State of America with this incredibly talented comedian singer named Heather Gardner. Um, it's like a Samantha B style daily show style show uh, once a week every Thursdays. Ben, though, are you concerned at all about an echo chamber effect? Are you worried that people on either side are not hearing the other side? No, because I mean, not from our perspective. I mean, because we are speaking to issues. And when we speak, Sometimes you may preach to a choir, but if your choir sings louder than the other choir, you win elections. And in mm. past, the Democratic Party was not preaching to their choir. You know, Trump preached to their choir. He's out there doing 10 appearances. You know, he's going from Ohio to Florida and he's doing all those press ops. And the Democrats sometimes take that for granted. So we're bringing this new aggressive style, unapologetically pro-democracy and pro-issues that matter. All right, we've got one more segment with the brothers. This is where we're gonna have some fun. Some key questions here. Who's the smartest brother? Who's the funniest brother? More questions like that. We've got a special game when we come back. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. More of the issue is after this.
Next week on The Issue is one of the top political impressionists on TikTok, Matt Friend. Here he is doing politicians reacting to Harry and Meghan's interview with Oprah. What you have to realize is, to Harry and Meghan, I understand completely the, what it's like to feel trapped in your tiny little shell, scoobity boop boop, scoobity doo, like Ted Cruz in Cancun. You know what, Mr. McConnell? You have to know that going to Cancun was my decision. I did feel trapped. <laughs> Matt Friend with us next week on The Issue Is. We wrap up this week with other viral stars, the Micellus Brothers, the guys behind Midas Touch. I want to play one moment from one of the podcasts you did. Uh, this is with President Trump's niece, Mary Trump, where you all had a bet on who she said would be the dumbest member of the family. Here's that moment. If you had to pinpoint it, which of his kids is, is the dumbest? I, I totally convinced this Donnie. Junior? Yep. <laughs> wow! I, know, so I, I won that bet. I think, I I think that Jordy bet. wins the bet. <laughs> I, I definitely won that, Mary. Jordy got that one right. So, inspired <laughs> by your own questioning and your own game, we're going to do our own game here. I want you all to try to answer honestly a few questions about the three of you as we all get to know you better. So, who is the smartest brother? I'm just going to go Ben because oh, he's right got the law degree. Okay, Ben yeah. Ben wins for the smartest brother. Who is the funniest brother? Ben. <laughs> ben. ben uh, I'm going to go Jordy on this one. Okay. Really? Who, is, who is the most athletic brother? Oh, absolutely Jordy. Jordy. I'm just, it's definitely me, hands down. They can't, they can't do anything. Uh, who is the best cook? <laughs> me, for sure. Brett. For sure, No, Brett. no, not, not even close. And not what's, even what's your specialty, Brett? Brett? A penny all just vodka. Good snob. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and finally, perhaps most important, who is the best looking brother? Jordan. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not about to start a Twitter war here. It's clear that everybody he, goes Jordan, to Jordy. He, he's the Twitter. He's the youngest. If you, if you rewound when I was however young Jordy is, it could have been a close competition. But Jordy's the youngest. We'll give it to him. All right. Uh, you guys, thank you so much for being here. You know we love to play music on the show. So we're going to end with your own music. This is a song that Bette Midler recorded for you all when Donald Trump left the White House. So thank you all for watching The Issue Is and the Divine Miss M. Take it away. We're free at last. Pack up the class.